You're listening to the Be Better Off Show by Kelly Partners. I'm so excited to introduce our second guest speaker today, um, William Thorndike. Now, William's the author of what would be my third favorite book, which is right here. I keep it right here in my desk drawer, close to my heart. And if you're, if you're a shareholder of ours and you haven't read that book, do yourself a favor. It's, it'll be good for your life and good for your business and certainly good for your investing. Now, I have a formal uh, introduction here I'd love to read. And, and we're obviously ecstatic that Will's with us today. Our second keynote speaker for today is Will Thorndike. He's a graduate of Harvard College and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's the managing partner of the Cromwell Harbor Partnership, a private investment company with a variety of long-term holdings. Prior to Cromwell Harbor, Will founded Housatonic Partners, a leading private equity firm with offices in Boston and San Francisco, known for exceptionally long investment holding periods. At Housatonic, Will was the pioneering institutional investor in the search fund, fund asset class and played a central role in refining its acquisition criteria. Will is a founding principal at TTCER, a private investment partnership, a co-founder at Compounding Lab, an investment collaboration focused on long-term consolidations and a lead investor at Banyan Software, a related platform in the vertical market software industry. He's chairman of the board at CNX Resources, a publicly traded New York Stock Exchange listed energy company and the co-chairman of Everarch Holdings, a London-based acquisition vehicle publicly traded on the London Stock Exchange. He's also a director of several private companies, including QMC Telecom. Will is also a founder and jury member for the Singleton Prize for CEO Excellence, serves as a trustee for the Cromwell Harbour Foundation, WGBH College of the Atlantic, and the Land and Garden Preserve. He's a frequent lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Harvard Business School, and often um, speaks on both capital allocation and search funds. Will is the author of The Outsiders, Eight Unconventional CEOs and Their Radically Rational Blueprint for Success which has been translated into 11 languages, is the co-host of the 50X podcast. And just before Will starts, I think we should mention that Warren Buffett says, and I quote, an outstanding book about CEOs who excelled at capital allocation. That's a pretty fantastic endorsement from somebody that we all admire. And so without further ado, welcome, Will. Thanks very much, Brett. Very nice to be here and uh, very nice to be following Lawrence, who's terrific. I'd love to start at the beginning uh, because the beginning's a great place to start. You finish school, you go off to, to university. How did you sort of end up interested in investing? What was that journey? It's interesting. My um, first job after college after undergraduate was working for an operating company in the publishing business. And the first summer after college, I went on vacation in Maine, actually where I am now, um, in the Northeastern US. And um, as it often does in Maine, for the entire week of vacation, it rained. Uh, and so I ended up, I'd brought two books with me, but by about Tuesday of the week, I'd finished both books. And I looked on the bookshelf of the house that we were renting, and I pulled down a book called The Money Masters, uh, which is um, a book by a guy named John Train. It was published in 1980. I would still highly recommend it as sort of a foundational investing text. And it's basically a profile of, you know, roughly 10 outstanding investors. The first chapter is on Buffett. And I read that first chapter on a rainy day, and I had sort of a, you know, stereotypical light bulb moment. And I sort of knew immediately that that's what I wanted to do. And I actually sent away, you had to do that by, you know, snail mail in those days for the collection of Berkshire letters. And I read them all and disappeared down that rabbit hole, which I've been happily wandering around in for, you know, 30 plus years now. So after, after that moment, and, and I think many of us have, have had a similar experience. I, I know when I read Hagstrom's book, I think it was 1997, I wrote to Berkshire, they would send you these bound copies of the of the um, of Buffett's annual letters. Was that before you went to, to Stanford or after? Before I went to Stanford. I actually went to Stanford partially because Stanford at that time had a legendary investing professor, a guy named Jack McDonald, um, who taught a second year class in investing. And really at that juncture, sort of the early 90s, he was really the only, he was the lone outpost of sort of bottoms up 
value investing in traditional business schools, which you know generally had people who believed in efficient market theory, um, kind of guarding the guarding the gates to the curriculum. And Jack Jack McDonald uh, taught two classes. He taught a class in the fall, and if you got a good grade in his class in the fall, you could apply to the spring seminar. And in the spring seminar, you showed up twice a week to hear from different amazing investors for 90 minutes. Um, and, you know, Phil Fisher was still alive. He came and spoke, if you're familiar with him. Buffett came every year, but my year, because the year I was there, he was he had his hands full running Solomon Brothers, but it was just a, an amazing, uh, wonderful class. So one of the reasons I selected Stanford was that it had very uniquely at the time, uh, truly outstanding curriculum in this area through, uh, through this, you know, that one professor, Jack McDonald. And so you you leave Stanford. What were the sort of next the next steps? And full of this knowledge, how did you start to try and um, I guess execute some of what you'd learned in small ways as you built some capital? Yeah. So basically, right out of business school, I had a chance to work for two individual investors in the Boston area who were at the time in their mid fifties and looking to invest personal capital in private companies. And so I went to work for them literally out of a closet in the back bay of Boston, uh, looking for private company investments for, for their personal capital. And from the outset, we brought in a group of outside co-investors who are also sophisticated, long-term oriented uh, individual investors. And we made a series of investments on a, on a deal by deal basis eight investments over the first four years. And those businesses had the economic characteristics that you know we have always focused on, which are very much sort of core Buffett principles. Um, they were businesses that had you know, very strong recurring revenues, very close relationships with customers, clear identifiable competitive advantages, and they were in growing, long-term growing markets. We still own three of those eight companies today, kind of amazingly, you know, 25 years plus in each case. Um, so um, anyway, from very early days, we were you know, we were focused on a very specific type of business. Yeah. And so you, as as a young man working in in these investment roles, were you was the structure of how you invested set up so that you could accumulate capital and grow some capital on your own account, or were you an employee or co, no, co owner? Question. Yeah, the reason I chose to work with those two guys out of this closet was that as opposed, I had other alternatives to go work for, um, you know, larger firms. Um, but I had a chance to earn a carried interest in their capital from day one. So I had extremely low current compensation, but I had a, you know, meaningful equity opportunity if we generated interesting returns from day one. So that was key, key part of my thought process in joining them. It's a good, you know, it's a good, Thing to explore because in, in building out the Kelly Partners model, it's really been about making sure that young professionals have an opportunity to build a business and earn an equity return much earlier than they would in, in comparable, you know, typical other situations where they would stay an employee for much longer, which we think has created alignment and a much better situation for, for our people. But, I, you know, I think a lot of young people don't know how to make that step and haven't done that reading, hence my, my sort of interest there. After you go on and you, you, you have a, a, the career that you've had, um, how do you come to write the book, The Outsiders? And in particular, what after a long investing career made you, was it another sort of light bulb moment that made you think, let's, let's write this book or... Or was it something that you found in research that you were doing? Or how did, how did that come about? Yeah, it, it wasn't a light bulb moment. <clears throat> it was much more organic and incremental than that. So at my, the firm that I founded after joining those two guys was called Housatonic Partners. And every other year, we would host a conference for um, CEOs, for the CEOs who were running our existing portfolio companies, for the alumni whose companies we had exited, and for CEOs who we were wooing to run future companies. So we did that every other year. And about 15 years ago, the format for those is we go somewhere to a resort in the Western US for three days. And um, we have a series of speakers come in and we always have headliner speakers, people like Jim Collins and Michael Lewis and Nate Silver and a bunch of 
of people like that have come over time. And then we have more pragmatic, practically oriented talks. And about 15 years ago, I raised my hand and said, I'll do one of those more practical talks. And I then had to figure out what I was going to talk about. And I decided I would profile, you know, an exceptional CEO. And I had heard about, done a little bit of reading about Henry Singleton, uh, the former CEO of Teledyne, who's one of the chapters in the book. And we had a Harvard Business School student working for us between years at business school that summer. And I asked him if he wanted to do an independent study in his second year in business school to do a deep dive on Singleton for this talk. And this guy had played college tennis. He's a wonderful guy. And he turned to me and he said, well, unfortunately, I've just committed to another independent study, but my doubles partner is looking. <laughs> so I, I, called up, I called up his doubles partner. It was a guy named Aleem Chowdhury, exceptionally talented guy. He'd been a you know, Phi Beta Kappa in physics at Stanford. And uh, Aleem agreed to do it. And he did a full year independent study. And we did a very deep dive on Singleton and Teledyne, his company, and all of the peer companies, all of the 60s era conglomerates. And in the first semester, we did a deep analytical dive. And in the second semester, we interviewed everyone alive who'd had anything to do with the company, former board members and investors and employees and competitors. And it just ended up being incredibly, much more intellectually interesting than I'd expected. And so as I was writing up research, preparing for the talk, Aleem came to me and he said, well, there's a really talented guy in the class behind me who's looking for an independent study next year. Do you want to do another one of these things? And so that was a guy named John Gilligan, who was a summa in chemistry from Harvard, right? So I, did, I ended up doing one a year really deep dives. The students and the HBS students got full year credit. And then they got me access to the Baker Library, which is the library at Harvard Business School, which is the world's leading repository of business, historical business information, which is essential for the, the data piece of this. You know, over time, I did one a year, um, incredibly slow pace for such a short book. You know, it took me a year per chapter. Um, but uh, after about the third or fourth one, it occurred to me this, you know, might might be something more. There might be a book project here, but only that only dawned on me over time. So it was not a light bulb moment. And so was eight, did it take eight years to do the eight CEOs or was it slightly? Eight years. Yeah. It took eight yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. And as you, as you're going through these projects, did the, did the, did the sort of thought current start to come together or, you know, was it three years in that you thought, well, hang on, there's some similarity here. Yeah, so what I expected when I did it, the loose model I had in my mind as it was going along was that book I referenced earlier, The Money Masters, and you know, which profiles, I don't know, eight to 10 great investors. So the point of The Money Masters is there are all sorts of different approaches to investing that can produce exceptional long-term returns. There, there's a variety of paths to, to exceptional results, which is what I expected as I was going through the, the work. But after about year five, it just became clear there were it was a very strong pattern, a much stronger than anticipated pattern across the group. And that held very strongly across the, you know, across the eight. And so when you, when, when you then pulled the book together, did you pull it together as a book or was it really a, a manual for use within Housatonic? Was it informing the way that you're investing within, within the business? It, um, it, it, it really came together as a book. It wasn't really a playbook for Housatonic, although some of the learnings I think have been beneficial to us. I mean, the big difference when you're investing in private companies is that, you know, as the control investor, which at Housatonic, we usually are, not always, but we usually are, you really do have control over capital allocation, which is something we'll talk about, one of the key areas of overlap across the eight. Whereas in a public company setting, as an investor, you usually don't have control over that, right? So so the, the, the CEO has, how the CEO thinks about capital allocation in a public company is critical. In a private company, you know, we theoretically, or not theoretically, we are actively involved in that process, working with the CEO, partnering with the CEO. But if we have disagreements about that, we ultimately control. So it's a little bit different. But, the, but some of the lessons in the book have made their way into our playbook, including the power, even in private companies, of opportunistic share repurchases. That's something we've executed across a variety of our, our companies, private companies over time. But that that was a major lever of value creation for all, all eight of the CEOs in the book. So Will, for our, our listeners today, our shareholders, could you explain what you think, you know, what you what are the major principles of the book and how you think 
um, potentially our shareholders uh -huh. should should think about our business with respect to those ideas, but also how they would use those ideas in their investing life generally. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, at a high level, the book is a study of eight high performing CEOs who each had to meet two tests. So first they had to have better performance over their tenure than Jack Welch had during his tenure at GE. Now Jack Welch's star has dimmed pretty considerably in the last three years or so, but um, his returns while he was in the seat at GE were truly exceptional. And so there was sort of an absolute test, better returns relative to the broader market than the Jack Welch had. And then the other test, which I think is actually the, the more important of the two tests is they needed to meaningfully outperform their peer group across two market cycles, a minimum of two full market cycles. So all of the CEOs in the book um, met those two tests. And it turned out that there were, if you looked in detail at the key decisions that drove the value creation over their tenures, there was very high overlap um, in a couple of key areas. So the first of those areas was in this area of capital allocation, which we've touched on a little bit. And the way I would uh, think about capital allocation is um, if you are CEO of a company, um, you basically have three ways that you can raise capital to invest. The first is you can tap your free cash flow. The second is you can um, raise debt. And the third is that you can issue equity. That's it. And then there are really only five things you can do with that capital, right? You can invest in your existing operations. You can buy another company. You can pay a dividend. You can repurchase your stock or you can pay down debt. Again, that's really it. But over very long periods of time, you know, and the average tenure for the CEOs in the book was 20 years. And Brett, you're very early on. You've got at least 20 years to go from here. Um, but over very long periods of time, it turns out the decisions CEOs make across how to source capital and how to deploy it have a massive disproportionate effect on uh, long-term outcomes, per share outcomes for their shareholders. So if you think about it very simply, if you had two businesses that had identical operating results, same level of revenue and the same level of profitability or cash flow, and two different approaches to capital allocation, fast forward 10 or 20 years, you'd have two very different share price outcomes for shareholders. Um, and so these CEOs shared a very specific approach to capital allocation. And we can go into more detail on that, but they, it was very different than their peers approach to capital allocation. So that was one area of commonality. The other area of commonality was they, um, they had a similar, and, and Lawrence uh, got into this in his talk, you know, really well, but they had a similar approach to sort of um, organizational design and culture. And, and basically they had a strong preference for decentralized organizational structures and the related culture of sort of frugality and entrepreneurialism and pragmatism that goes with that. Um, so those, those were two areas. And then, you know, just as a you know, personality wise, um, they were interesting because um, they came from a wide variety of backgrounds. So one was a former astronaut one was a widow who had been out of the workforce for 20 years. One was an investor who had never run a company before. Two were very high level mathematicians, right? So they variety of backgrounds, but they shared some common characteristics. All of them, all eight were first time CEOs. That's maybe the most surprising finding in the, in the whole book. Um, half of them under 40 when they got the job. Only two of them had MBAs. Four of them had engineering degrees. And if you were going to reach for adjectives to describe them, you would not reach for the typical CEO adjectives, sort of charismatic, visionary, and strategic. Instead, you'd use words like pragmatic, flexible, cool, rational, agnostic, patient, humble, words like that. So it's the profile was, you know, really in some interesting ways, quite, quite different. So th those were some of the, some of the findings, Brett. And I think if you look at, you know, Kelly Partners, uh, you know, um, I think if you read your owner's manual, I think it's very clear that you're, you know, you're, have, you have a similar focus as you're sort of thinking about running the business and, and, you know, sort of a laser focus on per share outcomes. Um, 
we can talk more about that, but you know, the, the, in the long run, what matters for shareholders isn't whether the business in absolute terms grows a lot. It's whether it grows a lot per share, grows profitability per share. Ultimately that's, um, you know, that's what the market will focus on. It's a great point. And well, it's not that well understood because, you know, I often say that um, people are, are very focused on absolute size and scale, obviously, as Buffett says, has some advantage, but how you get there is important as well in terms of how much resource you consume to get to that size. Um, and, and so our focus has always very much been not doing another dollar of business unless it meets our metrics and, and doesn't absorb you know, more capital than, uh, than it should. Early in my career, I worked in a software company and they pioneered the first piece of software that sought to essentially industrialize um, Rappaport's EBA theory um, so that you could plug it into Bloomberg, take the feed and get, get a view of 30 different ways of looking at investment returns, but in particular EVA. So for our shareholders who don't know what economic value added is, it's getting a return you know, above the weighted average cost of capital. So that very much, at, at, I think I was 23 at that point, influenced me strongly. I was around an a ex-maths professor and an entrepreneur and some people that really understood finance. Um, but they were very much about, you know, you've got to get somewhere without consuming an enormous amount of resources. It also sort of taps into that sustainability, you know, theory that's around these days in terms of uh, why do less with more when you can do more with less. And then from a personal point of view, when I started, I didn't have a whole bunch of capital anyway. And so we had to find ways to invent um, capital through smarts and, and effort. Um, so it's very much informed the culture of the business. When I look through your sort of seven big principles, you know, capital allocation is a CEO's most important job. What counts in the long run is the increase in per share value, not overall growth or size. Cash flow, not reported earnings, is what determines long term value. Decentralized organizations release entrepreneurial energy and keep costs and rank her down. Independent thinking is essential to long term success, and interactions with outside advisors can be distracting and time consuming. Sometimes the best investment opportunity is your own stock. With acquisitions, patience is a virtue, as is occasional boldness. Now, I, I, I noticed in, in your introduction, and I've seen online, you're involved in the Singleton Prize for CEO Excellence. And so, you know, every time I, I reread your book, um, and this is a very well-read book I, I have here, Henry Singleton seems to stand out very strongly as a person and as a, um, a CEO. Could you share with our our shareholders, you know, is Singleton the sort of prototypical ultimate CEO? Singleton's just, he's just a fascinating character because he's sort of a, he's sort of an extreme, right? So Singleton's background is he's a brilliant scientist and mathematician. So he goes to MIT here in the, in the Boston area and he gets a, you know, undergraduate degree, a master's and a PhD in electrical engineering. His PhD thesis, in his PhD thesis, he programs the first computer ever at MIT. He then, uh, World War, it's around the World War II era. He does a bunch of pioneering work on radar and he invents a technology called degaussing that allows allied warships to avoid radar detection. He then goes in after the war, he goes into the private sector into R&D for Litton Industries, another electronic component. And he designs the inertial guidance system that is still in use in commercial and military aircraft, right? So when he's 23, before all that, he wins the Putnam Medal, which is given to the outstanding young mathematician in the United States. So he's a you know absolute top tier STEM, you know, genius level guy. He's a grandmaster in chess. He likes to play chess blindfolded. Okay. So he drops down into the business world with that background as a CEO. He starts a company when he's about 40 years old. He has no experience running companies or anything. And he ends up building a conglomerate during the 1960s. And everywhere along the line, he's just, he's just, his whole wiring is just to sit down himself and do the math and figure out how to create the most value. And so over time, this leads him to involve an entirely differentiated approach to running his conglomerate versus everybody else in the United States. So he never splits his stock. He ends up repurchasing over time, 90 plus percent of his shares outstanding. He runs 
an unbelievably decentralized organization. It's actually the closest analog to Teledyne when it was run by Singleton is the company that Lawrence is on the board of, Constellation Software, where, you know, I think there are, you know, 500 operating units of Constellation. Singleton had 130 of them, but, you know, only 20 people at corporate. And so he just sort of, he has a complete, and he does not spend any time providing guidance to Wall Street or any time with the business press. He just doesn't view that as a good use of time. So no one can really figure out what he's doing. But over long periods of time, he just has unbelievable otherworldly returns. So if you're one of his shareholders, you're you're extraordinarily happy. So for his first 25 years uh, as CEO, he generates a 25% IRR. So if you, you know, if you had invested ten thousand dollars with him, it would be worth, you know, two hundred and fifty times that, you know, so later. So, you know, I mean, just just kind of incredible off the charts, uh, off the charts performance. But, uh, you know, he's sort of a, he, he's sort of an extreme because of the of the background. But those principles, those those actions were taken to varying degrees by a number of the other CEOs in the book. And it number of the number of other current CEOs, including Mark Leonard, the CEO of Constellation, following very similar, very similar approaches, very similar playbooks. So on, on Constellation, and, you know, we've been very much inspired by um, what Mark's done at Constellation. But what has been so interesting over the last 12 months was that when we um, first connected with Lawrence, he, he was the first person ever um, from any, you know, any investor any investment banker or anyone I've ever dealt with that understood the benefit of mastering the acquisition process and doing more acquisitions, but not necessarily increasing the size of those acquisitions. And so, well, everyone I'd previously met had said in order to grow our group, we would need to grow the size of the acquisitions that we make over time in order to move the needle Whereas my view from the beginning was that you could simply make um, more of the same acquisitions and just get better and better at what you're doing. Now, I haven't spent a lot of time explaining that um, to the world because you tend to be in a conversation with yourself and um, it's better to prosecute the argument by delivering in the business than prosecute the argument um, in a theoretical sense with anyone else. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on on sort of constellation, you know, they've done 600 transactions, 25 countries, uh, sorry, 25 years, 100 countries. And and are there other examples of where large business has been able to be built without having to take on what are typically regarded as transformative acquisitions that in 95% of cases transform in the negative direction? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it is a distinguishing element of Constellation's approach. I mean, their average transaction side across, size across those 600 transactions is $5 million. Average enterprise. It's kind of remarkable. Mark sort of built a machine to systematically um, buy smaller companies because they're less efficient. And yeah, there are, there are analogs from the book that John Malone, who was a yep. you know, CEO in the book who ran cable television companies. But John's my favorite in the book, by the way, Will. He's amazing. Malone's amazing. I mean, and actually he and Singleton are really, they're, they're the two high level mathematicians, lots of similarities between those two, but Malone was operating in the cable television business in the United States when it was truly a monopoly business. And he just built a similar formula for, you know, for buying lots of little, lots of little cable companies at very low multiples over time. And then he would improve operations. In that case, he, it wasn't just best practices. He was able to, you know, buy their programming at a, significant volume discount. So sort of overnight, he could lower their cost base, but um, he had a formula for that. And then, and if you look around, there are lots of, there, there are other examples. I mean, among current companies, the company I think in many ways is most similar to Constellation in the US market is Transdime, which is run by a wonderful guy named Nick Howley, and they buy niche aviation components. So these are essential pieces of hardware that go into aircraft frames. And um, they can never, you know, you can, once one has been approved by the FAA, it, it's in there forever, but it needs, it's on a regular replacement and service cycle. So it's a, it's a wonderful business has wonderful economic characteristics. Unit economics are very good. It's a highly fragmented market. And Nick Cowley, who has got an almost identical tenure to Mark Leonard has been running that company in that same industry 
focused like a laser beam on that industry, built mostly through small acquisitions over almost 30 years now. So, um, so for us, do you see that there's a, uh, that that long, that that laser focus, long runway and not getting distracted, there do seem to be some strong examples for us to, to follow? Absolutely, Brad. I think you're, you're very much on that same path, you know, and, and why, why divert from that, right? I mean, you've got a highly fragmented market. You have no shortage of accretive deals you can do. You've figured out a best practices sort of playbook that's, I think, exceptional. And um, you're sort of developing, like a big, a big piece of this is how do you, how do you finance, how do you get the finance flywheel going so you don't need any more equity capital? That's the key to the, and um, in Mark's case, it's been a free cash flow machine. And in, in Transdive's case, uh, Nick Halley has been a little more comfortable using some debt. He's created a lot of value that way, actually. Um, but, you know, they, they both evolved their own approach to, to flywheel, but you're, you're well down that path. So it's, it's great that you've used that term because um, just for our shareholders, um, I shared that I got an email on a Saturday morning. I was literally in the butchers picking up some meat for a barbecue and I looked at my phone when it dinged and there was an email from Lawrence there. I had a similar situation where I just absolutely love Will's book and then I got this email, I think it was on a Friday, and I looked at my phone and I went, oh, and I thought, again, I thought it was somebody talking about Will's book, um, but it was Will himself. And then in subsequent conversations, you know, the two incredible insights that we've had over the last 12 months from Lawrence, it was, you know, 600 transactions, average deal size at Constellation, 5 million. Hey, Brett, you, you're right. You don't have to do bigger and bigger deals. And that was, that, that has given me a great sense of peace that we can just keep doing what we're doing and that there's at least one person out there that sort of understands <laughs> what we're on about. Um, and then in, in chatting with Will, what was terrific is since the inception of Kelly Partners, every person that's joined, we've given a copy of a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. And the reason is, Will, that I, I always believe that a lot of people talk about culture as if it's an input, whereas um, books are an input that give people a common language and an output from a common language is a culture. You know, you can't be Italian really if you don't speak Italian because you're really not going to understand the nuance of the culture. But what was fascinating about that book from my point of view was it just resonated disciplined thinking, disciplined people, disciplined action. And that resulted in this idea that Collins pioneered called a flywheel. And so that's a long explanation for our shareholders in, in that when um, I first got on a Zoom with Ken and Will, Will said straight out, he said, hey, Brad, I can see, I think you guys really have a flywheel um, on the move here. And I, as we have been building the company, I so often use that term that you would have to push this thing up hard. And, and over time, though, you'd start to get this flywheel. And if you just stuck at it and just kept pushing, eventually you got some momentum and momentum is just incredibly powerful. Um, so, you know, Will, you've made a huge contribution to, to our group because from the other side of the world, when somebody with some clues um, can, can actually see what we've been trying to build. And for our shareholders, I'd love them to understand that we, our, our businesses pay a 6.5% central services fee and a 2.5% IP fee that we, that we deploy 100% of that. That's 9% of revenues in making these businesses better. Accounting firms generally, they're partnerships. So in a partnership, all of the money that's made each year is typically just paid out to a partner. There's no retained profits. There's no investment in any flywheel. And so those businesses, while they can uniquely remain profitable in, in the accounting industry, they don't necessarily year to year become stronger and stronger businesses. And so I guess we'll, you know, can you share with our shareholders that sort of conversation that we had in terms of We've definitely got a financing flywheel and an acquisition flywheel around how to do deals. I believe that that reinvestment from our businesses is giving us an ability to continually play at a level that our peer set are just not going to be able to touch. What do you think the long-term impact of that type of focus can be? I think it's extremely powerful, Brad. I mean, I think, you know, you guys, um, you just have a very long runway in front of you to keep doing what you've proven you can do very accretively. And so that's, that's very exciting, you know, and, and um, so I, you know, I, I, um, 
I mean, I'm a shareholder. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I can't I can't make any you know stronger statement of confidence than that, and I don't say that lightly. Um, but I, I think you guys have, you know, the ability to create an enormous amount of per share value over a very long period of time by continuing to, to do what you're, what you're doing very well today. I might, you know, the two, the, the number one thing I think, or not a thing to focus on will be how do you finance that, you know, and how do you in the most accretive possible way. And I love the idea that you're comfortable staying focused on smaller transactions, you know, in my, that's very, that mo- overlaps very closely with my experience creating value in private companies with similar approaches over decades. Inevitably in these long scale projects, um, if you look back at where the value is created, it's the smaller transactions over time that end up adding disproportionate value and the temptation to do a really big one and move quickly, is, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, a primrose path. Yeah, it's great to hear you say it. It's definitely something we've we've reflected on. I always think of C's candy in in that sense. It, it, you know, it was a small transaction that's delivered enormous value over time. I'd love you to share, if I can, while we have you, um, the impact that Jim Collins has had on you. I know that you knew Jim as a young as a very young man. I think you met him early on in your career. He's been very influential in the way that we think. You know, as you were talking then. I, you know, I've been very influenced by his long march idea. Um, what are your thoughts on Jim's work and, and how he's influenced you and, and your background with him? So I, I had the benefit of having Jim as a professor when I was, he was in business school. He was a lecturer at the Stanford Business School when I went there in the early 90s. So it was before he left and began to write and sort of built his, his second career. He was very young. He was in his early 30s, but he was uh, consistently ranked as one of the two or three best professors at the business school. He was probably 33 years old. Um, and I was able to take his class, which by the way, I, I had to audit because I, there was a lottery system and I couldn't get into it. So I had, to, I had to audit it. And then I've read everything he's ever put out. He was the first headliner speaker at our first CEO conference where he presented the good to great research a month before the book came out, which was unbelievable. And you know, we, there are a group of us who've you know, known him over time and we, we keep, in, keep in contact with him. He's an advisor to one of those companies I mentioned before that we're still invested in from our you know, very earliest days. And um, yeah, he's just an a incredibly powerful thinker. Um, he's, a, you know, he's sort of got a, you know, he, he refers to it as monk mode. You know, he's very, he sort of fiercely protects his time and ability to, you know, focus deeply on, on projects. And, um, he's been a, he's been a very important influence for us and for our companies over a long period of time. Really appreciate your time, Will. And I, and I, and I could speak with you for ages, but while we have you, um, we promised that we would open the floor for questions. Um, and for anyone that would like to ask Will a question, um, please pop it in the chat and, um, and, and we'd love to give you the opportunity to ask some questions. All right, we've got some questions in the Q&A section. So this oh, is great. from David who said, The Outsider's book is one of my favourites. All of the companies discussed in The Outsider's book are no longer listed other than Berkshire Hathaway. What US and international companies listed today exhibit outsider characteristics? Thank you. Yep. Ones that come immediately to mind, we've talked about two of them already. So Constellation Software, Mark Leonard is very definitely following that path. Nick Howley at Transdime is very definitely following that path. Um, Mitch and Steve Rails at Danaher have been following that path for a very long time, and they've entered a very interesting new phase. They've been building that company for 37 years. There's a home builder uh, in the in the United States called NVR that follows these principles very closely. A lot of these companies, by the way, sort of by definition, these CEOs often don't like to spend time, as I said, talking to Wall Street in the business press so the companies tend themselves to be quite low profile. But NVR would be another one. There's a company called Credit Acceptance Corp. It has an unbelievable long-term record, follows these principles very closely. That's done a remarkable job over a long period of time in reinsurance industry. Um, and there are a few others, but that's a that's a handful to sort of get started. Terrific. There's another question there I can see. Mr. Thorndike, if it's not a personal question, how many copies did your book sell? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good cheeky question from cutting cutting right to it um yeah. 
Yeah, it's sold. You know, it. it um, I mean, I'm not sure whether what I'm. You know, it's 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 sold. You know, reasonably well, and it continues to. It sells steadily, is what I would say, and it's you know a couple hundred thousand copies. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, it, yeah, it's 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 a very very interesting. Is there a scope for a second edition of The Outsiders, Edward Vesley? Yeah, I don't. Um, so I'm not going to do another version of the book. I think the ideas are in that book. I'm not going to do another, you know, the second edition with eight new CEOs. And um, I, I, I just don't, but I, I do think that I might do an expanded edition of the book and add, say, two chapters. Um, I think there's an interesting uh, nonprofit example of this that I'm interested in writing about. And um, I'd like to do a company outside of North America. Um, so I may add two chapters and do an expanded edition, but I, I don't plan a full, you know, a full 2.0. There's a great question from Anut Calvary. Given the dislocation caused by technology today and the fact that franchises are less durable than in, than in the past, are there any characteristics of a CEO that you believe are especially needed today? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think that the sort of core principle, the sort of this this idea that um, these CEOs are um, sort of deeply rational and continually evaluating the data, you know, they're, they're, that's sort of their their lens. Uh, I think that's that's a very powerful sort of mindset. In a, it becomes even more valuable the more dynamic the environment. Is how I would describe that, right? So. Um, you know, an example from the book that's kind of interesting is if you looked at the Graham family, so the, there's one woman CEO in the book, Catherine Graham, who's amazing. Um, not just, she's an amazing CEO. She has an amazing personal story. Um, her fam her son succeeded her uh, as the CEO of the Washington Post company, so a major newspaper in the United States and a broader media company. Uh, extraordinary results and extraordinary results relative to any other media companies, any other newspaper companies. The Washington Post company sold the paper. You know, her her son sold the paper um, mm -hmm. to Jeff Bezos six or seven years ago. It, 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 they, that, that is, it would have been inconceivable two years before that to, to have thought that. So it's an example of sort of the the pure rationality. What you know, basically, her son Donald Graham determined that. You know, the monopoly, the, the newspaper business in the United States had had a secular change and they were just not going to be able to run it profitably, period. And um, once that decision was made, they made, they took the next rational step, which was to actually sell it. So um, I do think, you know, having that, you know, a, a mindset that is, that is just data oriented, co consistently seeking information and then analyzing it and making rational decisions, that's the most powerful sort of most powerful possible template. And, um, you know, the, the world is getting, the, the rate of change is increasing. So it's, um, you can't sit back on top of a franchise and just milk it for a long time. That's, uh, that, that model no longer really applies. It's very interesting, Catherine Graham, that you mentioned, Will. Um, Warren Buffett bought into Washington Post Company, assured her that he wouldn't, you know, that he was a white knight, not a, not a predator, if you like. He seems to have spent a huge amount of time working with her how influential do you think warren was with respect to Catherine graham's performance and ability to get through that time and and also um the enduring i guess contribution that he's made to that family the son etc i mean i think it's impossible to overstate um buffett's influence on Catherine graham um and Catherine graham gets enormous credit for that so when buffett made that investment in the mid 70s you know, Buffett was was not a household name the way he is today. In fact, no one really knew who he was. And she met with him and immediately determined that this was somebody who uh, she ought to be listening to. And that was against the advice of all of her board members who were her husband's, you know, sort of trusted coterie of, of advisors, big, you know, fancy you know, lawyers from fancy New York and Washington DC law firms and this and that. She, she basically told them that, you know, it was sort of overruled them, put Buffett on her board. And then more than that, sort of um, designated him as her key advisor, her true mentor, and then ended up, you know, with under his tutelage, making some really, really unconventional decisions that over time created enormous value. So she, 
She gets a lot of credit for that. Very hard to do that. It, you can look back on it today and say, oh, of course, you know, she saw Buffett and put yeah. him on board. Yeah, that was very unconventional at the time. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a couple of great questions here. Um, could you name the nonprofit that you mentioned that you'd like to study for a chapter of? I, I can't, I'm not going to, I can't name it quite yet, but it's a, it's a foundation in the United States that has an entirely different approach to everything about the way it runs its operation, including how it invests its endowment. And I, I think there are lessons there that are, that are powerful and um, we deserve a broader audience. So more, more to follow on that one. Terrific. Who was Will's favorite CEO in the book and why? <laughs> That's a completely unfair question. Um, <laughs> choosing and, between and your children. Choosing between my children, exactly. Yeah, I um, Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, it probably, it's a horse. I mean, it, it, first of all, I, I learned an enormous amount from this project. It was just really fun. And I, you know, um, I could go in detail into each of the CEOs and why that was particularly fun. And, um, but it, to crisply answer that question after my rambling around here, it's a, probably a horse race between Singleton and Malone. I've got to ask you, um, Buffett attributes Tom Murphy as the best CEO he's ever seen. Did, have you ever or did you ever get to meet, oh, I believe he's still alive, have you ever met uh, Mr. Murphy and what was your impression of him? Yeah, he, Murphy is, yes, yes, I have is the short answer. I met with him um, during the book project. He was very generous with his time during the, you know, working on the chapter, but I've also seen him a couple of times since. He's, he's just a remarkable man and um, an incredible mix of talents. Uh, and the interesting thing about him is if you looked at the, he, uh, Tom Murphy ran a company called Capital Cities in the United States, which had you know, ran television stations and radio stations and other media properties, but really broadcasting businesses. And they just ran them way better than anybody else. And then they had an incredible record, you know, acquiring and improving operations, not unlike Kelly or Constellation. Um, but the other thing that was amazing about him is if you looked at the, what happened in the United States, you have this idea of a coaching tree, which is you sort of look at where a great football coach, American football coach, where, where his, assist, his well, inevitably it's a, it's a male in that, in that sport. So where his assistants end up going, how did they do? You know, how did his, how did his sort of mentees do? And the capital city's coaching tree is just unbelievable. And the best known sort of alumni, alumnus from uh, capital cities was Bob Iger at Disney, who had an incredible run. He just wrote a book that's actually, you know, that's a really, I would recommend that book. But um, Murphy remained a key advisor to him all the way through his tenure at Disney. And anytime he had a large deal, he would call Tom Murphy and get advice on how to process it. So that, that relationship remained, remained very close. And um, yeah, Murphy was a, an example of someone who was um, incredibly personable, um, but also very, very rational and, and, uh, and disciplined. And um, that's very yeah. interesting, Will, in that um, Iger's been noted for making some very unconventional at the time, unconventional looking and large bet acquisitions things like Star Wars and the, and the Marvel comic um, franchise. But I never knew that he had Murphy as a mentor in the background. And, and Murphy, you, you know, is certainly regarded by Buffett as, as, you know, the greatest CEO in history, in his view. Um, but similarly, Murphy made the, the ABC acquisitions, acquisition, which was, you know, again, a very unconventional transaction, uh, at least, um, in, with foresight at the time, in hindsight, were pretty good. So, were pretty incredible, which is which is really interesting. I just um, I've got a last um, couple of question here. Uh, what was the most appealing aspect of choosing to invest in KPG? I know that we got some questions from Will's um, mate Christian, uh, who, who shot him off to uh, to Ken, and I would say that um, the quality of those questions. Um, indicated um, thoughtfulness, which is, uh, you know, which which we haven't always seen, which is tremendous. And we always love uh, answering really great questions because it forces us to really think about our business. How did you, how did you sort of, how did that process happen? Yeah, I mean, Christian and I uh, are working together in something called Sun Mountain Partners. And basically, you know, we're, we're looking for companies that we think, you know, we can be invested in for 20 years. That's our lens, and that can 
have the potential to grow shareholder value at interesting rates over a multi-decade time horizon. So our, you know, and I'm investing personal capital. So it's, you know, that that's sort of the purest form of alignment. And I'm really just looking for situations where there's an opportunity to, you know, grow per share value at interesting rates uh, over very long periods of time with people who are trustworthy and fun to work with. And I'm looking forward to coming to a barbecue at some point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. that second box, but yeah. yeah. Terrific. On, on behalf of all our shareholders who've attended today, I really want to want to thank you, Will, for making the time. It, it's a huge commitment from from Maine to, to tune in um, and, and share your wisdom. I consider the association we've had with you to, to have been hugely rewarding and, and, and a huge amount of fun. Um, my particular joy in life is learning and, um, and, and getting around people that are cluey um, is, is just the most, to me, the most uh, type of fun. Um, so thank you so much for, for, for tuning in and sharing with us today. Thanks for having me, Brett. Take care. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for listening to the Be Better Up show. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Have a great day.